has been your favorite memory while living uh, and being with the chimpanzees? I've got two favorite memories. Um, one, the old female flow. And of course, when I got there, all the chimpanzees ran away from me. They were all frightened. And Flo lost her, her fear and came to trust me so much that her little precious, precious baby was about four and a half months old, just able to walk. And he was curious about me. And you know, these young chimps, they have these big eyes like some of the other primates. And he came over and he's looking up with these big eyes. And his mother is not, she's not stopping him, but she's protecting him. So as he's walking on all fours, she keeps one hand here, but she follows him and she lets him reach out and he touches my nose. And it was really sweet. And the other one was uh, the first chimp who lost his fear was David Greybeard. Speak up a little bit. A, a little bit louder. Can't you hear? You've made me talk too much. I think <laughs> I you hear. I was losing it last night. Yeah. Can you all hear? You can. So David Greybeard was the first to lose his fear. And he had this beautiful white beard. And for some, I don't know why he lost his fear before the others, did, but he did. The first chimp to lose his fear. First chimp. Mm -hmm. First chimp to lose his fear. And so on this day, I was following him through the vegetation. And I thought I'd lost him because he went through a tangle of thorns and vines and stuff. But when I struggled through, he was sitting there as though he was waiting. And maybe he was, I don't know. He was sitting, looking back. And so um, I sat down near him and there was a ripe fruit on the ground, I, a kind that I knew the chimps like. So I picked it up and held it out to him on my palm and he turned his face away. So I, I pushed my hand closer and then he turned around, he looked directly into my eyes. He reached out. He took the fruit, he didn't want it, dropped it on the ground, but very gently squeezed my fingers. And that's how chimpanzees reassure each other. So do you see that in that little story, he understood my motives were good. He didn't want the fruit, but I understood that he understood. And it was a very, very, very meaningful moment, probably the most ever. My question is that if you could go back in time, um, would you do the same things you have done, or would you change something of what you have done to the world? Because it's a real change. Basically, um, of course I've made mistakes. We all make mistakes. I think I've learned from them. And I think it was therefore good that I made the mistake. So going back and not making the mistake, only, only know what I know now could I do that. And basically, no, I did. My dream as a child was to go to Africa, live with animals and write books about them. And that's what I did. So uh, what I'm doing now, uh, I can't help it. I can't help going around the world sharing messages and information and raising awareness like you guys tried to do and did do in the classroom. So it's the same sort of thing. You have a passion and you have to follow it. My question is, how did you gain the chimpanzee's trust? Like I gained the chimpanzee's trust simply by not trying to get too close too quickly, by sitting. I didn't try to hide because they're much too small. They would have known. And even if the chimps wouldn't, the baboons which share the, share the habitat, they just, they notice anything quickly, much more quickly than the chimps. So they would see me. So just by being patient and going back every day, every day, every day, people said, what about weekends? And I said, what weekends? Every day being out there, wearing the same colored clothes. And um, if I accidentally got too close, I pretended I wasn't interested in the chimps at all. I was interested in eating leaves or something. And so gradually they relaxed. It's called habituation. You become a habit. Um, as a child, were you interested in chimpanzees or in animal conservation? 
I wasn't interested in animal conservation. We didn't even talk about it then. We really need to. There wasn't the, the horror that's happening now, our forests disappearing, prairies and whatever. Um, but animals, yes. From the time I could grow, I was interested in animals. I had a wonderful mother who supported that interest. And then when I was about 10 years old, I found a little book called Tarzan of the Apes. And I had just enough money saved up to buy it, because we had no money when I was working. And I took it home, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it. And of course, I fell in love with Tarzan, you know, this glorious lord of the jungle. And Tarzan went and married the wrong Jane. <laughs> So that was when my dream began. I would grow up, go to Africa, live with animals, and write books about them. Not chimpanzees. I wouldn't have dreamed of anything as completely exotic as a chimpanzee and any animal as long as I was out in the wild in Africa. And chimpanzees were just offered to me on a plate by Louis Leakey. Uh, when you began first, Well, mostly I wasn't afraid of them, but just sometimes when they started to lose their fear, they began to treat me as though I was a predator. They were angry. They wanted me to go away. And as chimpanzees are about at least eight times stronger than a man, and when they're up in the trees, you know, they stand about, about so high. But when they're angry, they put all their hair out and they immediately puff up twice as big and they get this furious scowl on their face or they're screaming with their great long uh, canine teeth. And they would sometimes be up in the tree and they'd start swaying like this and like this and like, until they were hitting me with the ends of the branches. And that was scary. Did they, did they ever forget? No, not really. I mean, we had one who's, who's a bully and he's knocked me over. And, hurt me a bit, but not really. I mean, if they wanted to kill me, they would kill me. Easy, easy, easy. But they luckily don't. When you were studying chimpanzees, which were the biggest difficulties you faced? Well, the biggest difficulty was A, when they ran away from me. Um, B, it's pretty steep, so you have to get quite fit to scramble up the slopes and, and down again. And probably the biggest problem of all was getting enough money to carry on with it. It's the same today. Nothing's changed. You travel all around the world all the time. But is there a place in particular that you haven't been to that you'd like to visit or somewhere that you'd love to go back? Well, I mean, all the places I love, I manage to get back to. And there's a lot of different places. There are some, some places in, um, in Asia that have high up in the, in the forested mountains where there's still all kinds of new animals to discover and I would love to go there, but I never will because it takes too long to get there and, you know, well, my schedule just doesn't allow me to do that anymore. And also, you get older and I don't suppose now I could climb up to those places I could have once, but I doubt it now. Uh, was there ever a time where you felt like giving up on your research? No. <laughs> well, did you ever think, did you ever think that by doing this, did you ever think you'd get people to actually start thinking about how we should treat the animals on it? Well, in fact, you see, the way it worked was first I had to get to Africa. Then I got this, the opportunity to study the chimpanzees. Then, um, in 1986, I realized at a big conference, we saw pictures from all over Africa, and that's when I realized that the forests were going so fast. They weren't before that. And that the chimpanzee numbers were dropping, and that's the day that I, I changed from being a scientist with the chimps to being an advocate for the chimps and the forests and the other animals. Like all your animals here, they need protection. And that's why roots and shoots are so important, because we're getting more and more people around the world. Roots and shoots and other such groups, we try and partner. Because 
if we can get a critical mass of young people like you who understand that we need to treat animals and their habitats with respect and each other with respect, we'll have a different world, won't we? Knowing that we still be in child and we don't know many things, why trust us so much that we can have a big change in the world with this project? Why, why being children, you think, why do I think you can make a difference? That children like us can make a big change in the world. Because I've seen it happening, that's why. Because everywhere I go, there are young people like you telling me what they've been doing. And some of the projects are big. You know, sometimes you get lots of different schools joining together. And I've been to a place where we were able to and I did it, the first one, to release a fish back into this uh, river where they'd been extinct for 50 years. And they'd now, they, these different groups had joined together and they were cleaning up, they were taking garbage out of the water, they were talking to the people polluting, they were writing letters to legislators. It took about five years, and, but they didn't give up. And so different groups joined in and then some people grew up but others joined in and they did it and that's happened three times so I know what you can do and if you don't do it that's going to be the end of the world because your parents haven't been doing it mostly I mean in general our generation has not been a good steward and if you guys aren't going to be better stewards then your great-great-grandchildren will be nothing left Do you have any advice for kids like us who want to make a change in the world? Well, I've just told you, join Roots and Shoots. <laughs> Think every day about the choices you make and how those might impact the environment, harm animals, um, or, or, or not be good for humans. And if everybody in this room makes those little choices and persuades their friends and their parents, you've already got a big change just from this one spot here. Now we've got people listening around the world, hopefully they can hear now. So if everybody who's listening makes the right choices each day, what you buy? Where did it come from? How was it made? Um, you know, what are you going to eat? Did it harm animals? Did the clothes you're wearing come from child slave labor somewhere? Little choices like that, turning off taps, not wasting electricity, uh, you know, walking if you can instead of taking a car or bicycling or something. It makes, starts to make a big, big difference. 